Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise you. Oh, what is that? Praise you the Lord. He is worthy. Let me let me wait a minute here, y'all. Oh, that's gray. My more gray hair. Okay. <laughs> praise, praise you the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. Amen. You say he's here grooming because I'm seeing myself. I'm just saying. Uh, <laughs> everything that has breath. Praise you, the Lord. He is worthy to be praised. Good morning, good morning, good morning, Bishop Arthur L. Weathersby of Yeshua Messiah International Disciple Training Center, as well as uh, Arthur L. Weathersby Ministries International. And you know, I have to give this announcement, this attack, this is uh, acknowledgement as well. I am also a part of the Churches of the Body of Christ. Amen. Out of Warsaw, Virginia, where uh, my apostle is uh, the founder and the prelate, uh, the illustrious and esteemed uh, bishop, bishop, Lord have mercy. I'm reducing him. Apostle Dr. Leonard Quentin Sampson, not on purpose, <laughs> Quentin Sampson, and also the presiding bishop, first presiding bishop, I should say, for the Churches of the Body of Christ. Uh, the Joint College of Bishops is Bishop David L. Dyer. An administrative officer is Bishop uh, Alfred Lawrence Sr. Uh, out of uh, Andrews, South Carolina. And my overseer is none other than my uh, Mississippi State. My Mrs. No, I'm, you know what? I just sprayed some spray in here to kill a fly. And I think I must be inhaling the fumes. <laughs> New York State of Mind, bro. Uh, uh, Mississippi po' boy out of Tampa, Florida, by way of Brooklyn, New York. None of, I'm from Buffalo, uh, New York, that is. None other than Bishop, the drive-by Bishop for the C-O-T-B-O-C. Bishop Carl Curry. Amen. Senior. Amen. Uh, I thank God for you, you, and you. And we're here today for our first devotional teaching for today, which this one comes from our daily bread, and we're in August, amen, the second month in this third quarter, August the 1st, and we'll be in 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, the ninth through the 22nd verses, but before we get there, we need to open up in a word of prayer and go from there to the scripture, is that all right, all right, that's what we're going to do, whether it's all right or not, I'm going to tell you, Amen, amen, amen. Oh, most gracious and eternal Father, Lord God, I come to at this hour just to say thank you. Thank you for having watched over, protected, and kept me from the last time that I spoke to you up until now. Uh, I, I want to make certain that there's nothing that I've done by thought, word, or deed from the last moment I spoke to you that's not pleasing within your sight. If it is, I need your forgiveness. Uh, I, I thank you, God, for this time. I thank you for this moment. I thank you for this opportunity that you've allowed me to do what I do, uh, teaching your word, God, uh, because this is a great desire that I have to do uh, to fulfill the purpose and will that you have for my life. Now, Father, I pray that you open up our hearts, minds, and understanding to those that may watch and listen in on what we have to say on, at this time. I pray that they incline their ears to hear what the spirit of the living God is saying to each and every one of them. And while they're yet being so inclined, uh, let them know that you expect us all to become doers of this word and not only just hear it. Now, again, I know who I am. I don't have a problem with that. I have no problem with where you have placed me and what you have called me to do and predestined, predetermined for ordained for me to do. But I know that I need to do this. I want the words from my mouth the meditations up out of my heart to be found acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. It's in the precious and matchless name of my Lord and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah, I pray with thanksgiving in my heart. Amen. 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 Let's go to Second Timothy, the fourth chapter, and let's pick up that ninth verse and go and conclude through verse 22. Now, mind you, I'm going to be reading from what is known as the Amplified Translation of the Bible. And this is where I will be reading. And if there's any change in, in what 
uh, translation I, I go to, you better believe the Holy Ghost is going to have to take me there. Because if he don't take me there, this is where I will be. Amen. Amen. So let's go to that ninth verse, Second Timothy 9, fourth chapter, the ninth verse. And we're going to go to verse 22, which is the end of the chapter. And it reads this way. Make every effort to come to me soon. For Demas, having loved the pleasures of this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Verse 11 says, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very helpful, helpful to me for the ministry. 12, but Titius, or Titius, I have sent to Ephesus. 13, when you come, bring the coat that I left at Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchments. 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. But that is no concern of mine, for the Lord will repay him according to his actions. Woo. 15. Be on guard against him yourself because he is vigorously, he, he because he vigorously opposed our message. Uh, 16. At my first trial, no one supported me as an advocate or stood with me, but they all deserted me. May it not be accounted against them by God. Mm. Make sure. Yeah, I'm making sure everything's okay. Yeah. Oh, my. 17. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened and empowered me so that through me the gospel message might be fully proclaimed and that all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was rescued from the mouth of the lion. 18. The Lord will rescue me from every evil assault and he will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, 19 says, give my greetings to Prisca and Aquila and to the household of Onesip Onesipophorus. That's Onesipophorus. Uh, verse 20, Erastus stayed on at Corinth, but I left Troph Trophimus, Trophimus sick at Miletus. 31, I mean 21. Try your best to come to me before winter. E Eubulus wishes to be remembered to you as do Putin's and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers and sisters. 22, the Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen, amen, amen. I read into our hearing from uh, 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter, that ninth through the 22nd verses. The word of the Lord is already blessed. May he continue to bless the hearing, reading, doing of his holy blessed word. But the Bible tells us that we need to be a doer of this word and not just a hearer. I need to take a drink from reading all them Greek names. Got my mouth all messed up. Lord have mercy. <laughs> yeah. What's the key verse? Or it's the 16th verse. All right, we're gonna read that again. Okay, that 16th verse says, At my first trial, no one supported me as an advocate or stood with me but they all deserted me may it not be accounted against them by god okay this daily devotional is from tim gustafson gustafson he's a prolific uh contributor to the daily bread uh uh what can i say cadre <laughs> that's good i said yeah daily bread writer the writing cadre that might that does these devotionals each and every day and um and so he's i think he's a pastor as a matter of fact but i'm not sure and his thought is in this together in this together all right let's start reading and see what the spirit gives us to share with you and it says this kelly was battling brain cancer when the COVID 19 crisis hit then fluid developed around her heart and lungs and she had to be hospitalized again her family couldn't visit her because of the pandemic. Her husband, Dave, vowed to do something. You know, um, over the last two and a half years of this pandemic, since it really started to hit uh, here in America, it has thrown things off in such a tremendous way. Uh, the, the regular way that we've been going about living our lives, that's been, that's been tossed upside down. And there are many things that have been uh, suffering through this 
um, the ability to interact with people, the ability to uh, do what we do in our relationships on a day-to-day -day basis, that has been hindered. Uh, people are sick in the hospital and you can't go visit them in a nursing home. You can't go visit them because of the protocol that keeps you away from certain environments because of the uh, the the heightened the heightenedy of the potential for the COVID virus to be spread, or if it's already there, then hey, forget about it. You're not getting in that facility. Uh, it's been very devastating and caused a lot of upheavals in the lives of people, and um, a lot of concern is going on. Let's read on. Gathering loved ones together, Dave asked them to signs with messages. They did. That's good. As 20 people stood on the street outside the hospital holding signs, best mom, love you. We are with you. Now, I want to tell you something. I like this. Our family, the husband came up. He said he was going to do something as he should. He's the leader. He's the head of the family. But let me tell you something. My ministry that the Lord has given me or Yeshua Messiah. I said, should I say Messiah? Yeshua Messiah? That's Jesus Christ. Uh, or, or if I say the Holy Spirit, I'm going to say Ruach HaKadosh, that he has given me, uh, happens to be family. And I've been operating from this knowingly that I was, this was my ministry since, oh, 24 years and six months. So two years after I got saved, God, this was going to be my, now, let me, let me help you understand this. At the point that he showed it to me, to the place where I am today, it's like night and day. How I understood it back then in February of 1998, it vastly differs from what it is today. God has allowed me to grow into that understanding of this ministry. He has allowed me to grow in my ability to explain how I understand this ministry. And one thing that I am very, very clear about in a family, there are many dynamics that take that make up a family uh, a nucleus. Uh, and, and it's the personalities from every individual within the family. You can even have twins and, 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 and triplets or whatever. And, and they're not the same. I mean, they may look the same. They may have some little things that they may do uh, mimic in one another or whatever. But they're not the same because everybody, the Bible says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. We are all unique in our own way. And everybody needs to know where their identity lies. Your identity does not lie with another person. It lies within who you are and whose you are. Uh, it's in him that we live, move, and have our very being. I just threw that in for free. But um, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the things I'm very adamant about is that within the family dynamics, you're gonna always, you're gonna find that you're not gonna always be on harmony about everything. Now, this is not a sad thing. This is not a bad thing because again, you're individuals and you're not going to agree upon everything. But one thing that ought to be a constant, and that should be this, Arthur, the love within that family. Amen. Now, mind you, it's going to have to be a love that you've never known before. What do you mean a love I've never known before? I'm talking about that love that we have. Throw that thing out the window. That will not allow you to do what I'm about ready to say. In a family that has a love that is found, they founded on the on on the love of God. Uh, uh, when John three sixteen says, "For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son." John fifteen thirteen when He says, "Greater love has no one shown than this, than when He laid down His life." Uh, Romans 5, 8, and God clearly proves his own love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, that love has to be the foundational love that you and I need to work for from in order to operate within our family. What are you going to say? Come on, you spit it out, Bishop. Let, let me tell you, anytime a situation comes up with a member of the family, the family ought to do a rallying together around, around that particular individual to do what? To encourage them and uplift them. This is unfortunately is something that is not happening today. And it doesn't happen, sadly to say, in, in my people's family. What people you talking about? I'm talking about African Americans. Uh, we, we don't function like that as a whole. Some families do, but not as a whole, we don't. 
uh, we have a tendency to allow some stupid stuff to cause a great separation from us that cause a divide. And I'm here to tell you that ain't so according to the word of God. Now I hear somebody in the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit saying, but Bishop Elect, Jesus Christ said, I came not to bring peace to the world, but I came to bring division. Let me help you understand what he means by that. What he meant by that is, and if you got to go into the word, study that thing to show you, yeah, two, two, uh, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, what you what he meant by that was that there were going to be people within the family that were going to be willing to side with him and become a disciple of his a follower and then there was going to be some to say nope i'm not doing that that's what he meant that's the division you know what that represents it's a difference of opinion that's all it is a difference of opinion but many people have allowed some idios idiotic things to cause a breakup of their family. And you know what the word of God says? That first off, you had better, if you, well, two things he says. If you got ought against your brother, before you bring a gift to the altar, you better lay down that gift and go back and get that thing right with your brother. But then it also says this, that, it, uh, 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 what else does it say, Arthur? Oh, oh. That we are to love one another but not only that there was something else i was thinking about uh-huh it's gonna have to come to me yeah it's gonna have to come to me i'm gonna have to let it come to me but yeah you are you ought you ought to be a oh let us come and reason together that's what it says let us come and reason together and when you reason together and you do it from the foundation of love unconditional love that god exudes that should be just oozing out of you as a child of god because you're filled with the precious holy spirit if you've been baptized in the spirit and and and, and that love that that everybody say that god is ought to just ooze up out of you if you allow it to oh my yeah yeah we 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 we, we, we have uh, uh, allowed ourselves to be so disenfranchised within our own relationship that we don't even have a, what we what it should be known as a family. We have things that that are uh, that that they're facet meals of what a family should look like or should be like, because why we have not. Oh, oh, the other part was forgiveness, forgiveness. You we have allowed things to cause a breakup in our families and we're unforgiving with one another do you not know what the word of god says if you don't forgive down here on this earth your heavenly father your father in heaven will not forgive you so if you think that you're getting into heaven and you hating down here on your family members because bishop elect you don't know what they did to me don't matter you get over that thing because what you will miss the kingdom I'm, I'm, I'm gonna show you something i'm gonna show you something you stick a pen here where i am let's go to first john arthur first john the third chapter and i'm gonna go to the 10th verse watch what it says by this the children of god and the children of the devil are clearly identified Anyone who does not practice righteousness, who does not seek God's will in thought, action, and purpose is not of God. Now watch this. Nor is the one who does not unselfishly love his believing brother. I'm going to tell you, that's talking about in the body of Christ or in the, in, in, in the discipleship. Because we are disciples of Yeshua, Messiah. Uh -huh. But let me tell you, if you cannot love your blood brother... Uh, then you can't be of God because first off, I'm going to cover what, I, it don't say blood brother here, it says believing brother. This is the Amplified Bible. I think in the King James it does say brother, but the Amplified says believing. Okay, irregardless, he said this, this is what Jesus Christ told his disciples, said, listen, I got two commandments that I want you to pay attention to. The first one is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. That is the first commandment with the promise. But he says, I got another one. It's liking under that. Love you one another. Now watch what he says behind it. He says, under these two commandments rest 
all of the commandments. And what is he saying? He said this to his disciples. If you love me, you will obey my commandments and follow my instructions. If I tell you to love you one another, that's what I expect. Why? Because God so loved the world. Let me help you. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What was lovable about the world at the time Jesus Christ died? Absolutely nothing. And a Romans 5, 8, and God clearly proves his own love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, let me help you. He died for the sins of the past, the present, and the future. Not just by the fact that while we were still sinners, we were going to sin even after he died, went in the grave and was resurrected by the glorious power of the Father. But he still loved us. He still died for us. And you trying to tell me that you can't get over some family thing, some issues within your family with a family member? Child, you don't understand what's going on. Then let me help you real good, particularly if you are a child and you got a mother and father. Oh, boy. <laughs> In this together. Yeah, I just want to make sure that that's what I'm looking at. Uh-huh. Uh, where are we going, Arthur? Oh, I know where we're going. We're going to Ephesians. Uh huh. And where are we at in Ephesians? Probably the sixth chapter. Yes, we are. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, Amplified Bible. That is, accept their guidance and discipline as his representatives. For this is right, for obedience teaches wisdom and self discipline. Keep, keep listening. Second verse honor, esteem, Value is precious, your father and your mother. Be respectful to them. Stop right there, Bishop Elect. I can't help myself. I got to stop. I have, I'm 69 years old in 10 months, in, into my 10th month. I'm, I'm no, I'm less than two months away from my 70th birthday, Lord's willing. One of the things that disturbs me in my time on this earth is that I have seen too many instances of disrespectful children to their parents in public, in public. And then I've seen it in the homes, but in public, a, a child being disrespectful to their parents. Are you kidding me? When I grew up, my mom came from Mississippi, the Delta in Mississippi. If I was disrespectful to her, do you not know that I would not be sitting before you today? My mother made it very clear. She brought me in this world. She would took me out of here. Now, let me help you understand. She raised me by herself. She went through a lot to take care of five boys. She had us raising us longer than any children she had ever had. And the children she had before us were girls when she was living in Mississippi. And, she, and you didn't think that she didn't mean what she said? Oh, you didn't know my mama. <laughs> uh -huh. And it says, honor, esteem, values, precious, your father and your mother, and be respectful to them. This is the first commandment with a promise. Now, now I'm glad that says that, because you know what? It says, verse 3, so that it may be well with you and that you may have a long life on the earth. All of this is in caps in verse 3 for, uh, for the Amplified Bible. But let me help you understand something, too. Let me help you understand something. Failing to honor and obey, uh, honor your, your parents is a clear indication that what, Arthur? You're going to be disobedient to God. What? How you come up with that? Oh, you didn't know that you were. Let me go back to 1 John. Okay, let me go back to 1 John, the third chapter. I think I'm going to go into the seventh verse. Watch what it says. Little children, believers, dear ones, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who practices righteousness, the one who strives to live a consistently honorable life in private as well as in public and to conform to God's precepts is righteous just as he is righteous. So little children, that's what God calls us. We are his little children. And let me go back to verse 10. Let me go back to verse 10. 
uh, uh, 1 John 3.10. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are clearly identified. Anyone who does not practice righteousness, does not see God's will, seeks God's will in thought, action, and purpose is not of God. Nor is the one who does not selfishly love his believing brother. So what is God saying? He says that you are my little children, therefore I am your father. Matter of fact, uh, Matthew 23, 9 tells you this. I'm time, I'm, I'm, this is called connecting the dots. Matthew 23, 9 says, Where am I at, Arthur? Do not call anyone on earth who guides you spiritually your father. For one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do you not know that we are the spiritual children of God through Jesus Christ? And we've been have, we have been adopted into the family of God through Jesus Christ. He is our father. We are his little children. And I'm here to tell you, if you cannot honor and obey and hold in high esteem your earthly father and mother, there's no way that you're doing it, going to do it by God. Because why? How can the word of God says, how can you love me whom you've never seen and hate your brother that you see every day? If you say that you can and you do, guess what? You are lying. And the truth ain't in you. But 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 I and so so children don't 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 freak out. Don't worry, I got you. I'm back in I'm back in Ephesians, in the sixth chapter, that fourth verse. Watch what it says. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate them to the point of resentment with demands that are trivial, or unreasonable or humiliating, or abusive, nor by showing favoritism or indifference to any of them. Bring them up tenderly with loving kindness in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. See, God is saying this to you natural fathers and mothers. This is how you, don't you provoke your children to go off on you. Don't you put them in the position where they act like they ain't got no sense. They're your children. And it says, don't be placing some unreasonable thing for them to do. You didn't do it when you was a child. You couldn't do it when you was a child. So why are you going to try to make them do something that you yourself did not do and could not do? The word says, don't put no demands that are trivial, meaningless, or unreasonable. Don't make no sense. Or humiliate. Why do you want to humiliate? You? And I've seen people do this. Humiliate your child or be abusive. Let me help you. We're not talking about physical. We're not just talking about physical. There's physical, there's verbal, and emotional abuse. There ain't no excuse for neither one of them. Not a single. You can't come up with an excuse to be physically, verbally, or emotionally abusive to anybody. Let no one a parent to a child. Who's just mercy? Who, who who don't have nothing to be able to do? They can't combat somebody, a parent or mother coming back at them. Why? Because they're obeying their parents. They're esteeming them highly. Up at verse one and two. So that's so that don't you think that gives you a right to go off on your children for no reason? Not according to the word of God, it don't. But bring them up tenderly. With loving kindness in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Let God do what needs to be done to, to straighten out your children. And, 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 and children, let the word of God work on your parents. Oh my. Oh my. Okay, Arthur. Okay. Let me get back in this devotional. Oh my. I tell you, family, don't that's I'm, I'm passionate. We are we are with you. With the help of a nurse, Kelly made her way to a fourth floor window. All we could see was a face mask and a waving hand. Her husband posted on social media, but it was a beautiful face mask and a waving hand. See, that's good right there. That shows the love that a family has for one another and, and should have. Amen. You ought to be able to see beyond 
Oh my, this is real good. Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh. Too many times what people have a tendency to do is look at the frailties and the weaknesses and the faults that people have, and they see them based upon that. But don't you know you ought to see a person beyond their frailties, their weaknesses, and their faults? Why is that so? Because God is on the inside working out, working a new thing in, in them. And it has not yet been revealed what they will become to you. We're in this together. Oh, my, this is good. This is real good. Late in his life, the Apostle Paul felt alone as he languished in a Roman prison. He wrote to Timothy, do your best to get here before winter. Second Timothy 4, 21. All right, let's go there. Mm -mm -mm. Second Timothy 4, 21. Try your best to come to me before winter. Eubulus wishes to be remembered to you as do Putin and Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren and sisters. Now, Timothy was uh, Apostle Paul's uh, son in the faith, and he took great, great pride in, in helping him to become a pastor and getting him prepared to go forth and do what he was going to do, along with the fact that he identified to Timothy that uh, his training is not just from Paul, but it came from his grandmother and his mother. See, his father was a Greek, so his father couldn't teach and teach him the ways of God because he was not of that learning. But his grandmother and his mother, you do recall in Corinthians that Paul seemed to have a problem with women, didn't he? Well, let me help you. He had a problem not with just the women, but the whole church at Corinth. They were buck wild in, in how they were administering the gifts of, of the spirit that, of God that had been given to them. They were blessed to receive the gifts. The full gifts of the spirit were operating, flowing within that church that was founded in the, one of the more corrupt societies on the face of the planet. But, but. These folks never understood that these gifts were not given to them so they can add them on to what they already were operating under from the world. They married the gifts of the spirit to that of the ways of the world. And they came in and brought the worldly, worldly ways into the church and they went buck wild. There was no order. The women did not respect the men, blah, blah. And they were running around here doing this, that, and the other, all out of order. And Paul came in and said, there is order in God's house because things must be done decently and in order. And he told the women to shut up and sit down. You're out of order when you go and, and do things beyond what the Bible says that you should be doing. Do you not know that the man is your covering? God covers him, but you are, but he is your covering. You can be gifted. You can be talented. And I put this in my book, um, Unless God Builds the House, and I think Uncheck the DNA, but I think I put it in Unless God Builds the House when I explained to the one, a, a man, a, 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 the wife, that just because, and this is just a truism, you may have more education than your husband because education was made available to you more so than it is an African-American male. That's just the truth. Anyhow, you might even have a better paying job because although women are not equitably paid in this in, in our society, a black woman, African-American woman has an opportunity to get a job, a higher paying job, more so than a man. That's all because the, the system is designed to emancipate a man. And it's been doing that ever since the year 1619, when, when they went and, 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 and snatched up slaves um, from the uh West Africa and, and brought them through the middle passage. And before they got off that boat, they snatched that man out of that family. He ain't got back since. And the emancipation is continued on, uh, not only through the, uh, the, 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 the mechanism of slavery, but is, you know what? It has trickled into our own interactions with one another. It's so crazy for me to understand and watch over the years that I've been on this planet why are we out here uh, uh, going against one another? I'm talking about the African-American male and African-American female. Don't you know that the Bible says a house divided cannot stand? We're in this together. That's the, the, the enemy knows that. That's why there's, so, there's such an upheaval in our community. We are not 
united together. Lord, help me. Um, yet Paul wasn't totally alone. The Lord stood at my side and gave me strength. He said, verse 17. All right, Arthur. Uh, Lord, help me. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened and empowered me so that through me, the gospel message might be fully proclaimed and that all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was rescued from the mouth of the lion. Yeah, you're going to find yourself where you're going to be alone because don't you know that it's sad to say, and I know this to be true, not just in ministry, just in life in general. Do not be surprised if the people that you think should be supporting you and encouraging you, they don't. What are you saying? Your family and church folk. It's, it's a sad statement. It's a sad statement. And in the African-American community, I'm picking on us. That's right. You're going to find this more than you're going to find anywhere else in any community within this on this planet. We do not support our own. We just don't do it. We do not do it. We don't encourage our own. We're apt to say something like this nonsensical thing. Don't, and I know what I'm talking about. What makes you think you're going to do that? Ain't nobody in our family ain't never done nothing like that before. And you, you ain't going to never become nothing. Your father was nothing. Your father before him was nothing. His father before him, when you come from a line of nothings. That stuff is the type of nonsense that spit out in our, in our own families. And you wonder why. You don't achieve. You wonder why you got family members walking around here with their head down and how they succumb to the ways of the world. Because you know what the street thing is? This is how smooth the street is. The street, the street, when they entice people, gangs, when they entice those people to be kids to become gang members, they say, listen, they get all up in the air. You know, I see your family don't love you. You know they don't love you. Because they won't do this for you. They won't do that for you. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, I got a pair of Air Jordans right here, brand new. They're yours. Oh, yeah. yeah. Here's about $40, $50. Go buy you whatever you want to buy. And they'll do that. And, you know, just every now and then drop some candy on you. And that's how they get them. That's how they get them. Then they give them a street name that changes their whole identity. And make them to be this and that. And all because they're not they're missing what, what it is that they should be getting in the home. So then they find out and on the streets that the street says, uh, well, we love you. We your family now. That's how they get those kids into the gangs. That's how they entice people into the street world, to the uh, 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 the ways of doing things out there on the street. That's why you need to know. And, and, and here's one thing that you're really going to have to gain understanding of. Um just because the fact that you're not going to get the type of support and encouragement from those that you think you should get it from, you had better know your self-worth. You had better know what you're capable of doing. Because if nothing else, if, if until you get in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to have to do some things and get things accomplished because you're going to have to believe in yourself. But once you get in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, then you can line up with me and sing this song. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And it don't matter about nobody. If God be for me, who can be against me? I don't care. <laughs> if God is for me, because he's the one that's providing everything I need. Oh, my. Oh, Lord, help me. End this together. And it's also apparent that he had some encouraging contact with other believers. That's good. Uh, uh, he, 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 Eubulus, Eubulus greets you, he said to Timothy, and so do the Putins, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. Yeah, I, that's inferred, y'all. That, that's inferred that, that, that he had that help from those people because he identified the ones that was against him. He didn't say these words against him, so that's inferred. We're created for community. I tell this to people all the time. God did not create you or I to operate as an island. You are not a, 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 a entity into yourself. You're an individual, but we are we are created to commune with one another. The Bible says that um, there are many. There are many. Uh, uh, there's one body, but there are many members in the body. 
and there are various parts attached to those members and they jointly fit together to make one. That's why we're in this together because the power, the greatest power that you and I can access is the power of the unification of the body of Christ when we are operating as one entity, not with all these multiplicities of, of, of things, doctrines and, and denominations and things that are creating such divisions and, and, and separations. That's not the work of the kingdom. It's certainly not the work of God. Oh my, oh my. We're created for community and we feel that most keenly when we are in crisis. That's what I said. We're supposed to rally, come together. What might you do for someone who may feel entirely alone today? Reach out to them. If you if you know somebody, if God has brought somebody in your pathway that's alone today, do you not understand what should be happening? I'm going to help you real good. John 15, 13. Let me read that from the Amplified Bible. And I'm just about done because we got some questions. And then there's a short prayer that Pastor Gustafson has for us. Um, I did say John, didn't I? I did say John, didn't I? Where am I taking you? What are we supposed to be doing, Arthur? We're supposed to be coming together. Um, what can we feel most keenly when we're in crisis? We might, we might do for someone. Oh, John 15, 13. Thank you, Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh. I tell you, I love the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I tell you, <laughs> that's how he works for Arthur. John 15, 13, watch what it says. No one has greater love nor stronger commitment than to lay down his own life for his friends. Let me help you real good with this one. God does not look for you and I to go to the cross for nobody. Neither of us. None of us can do that. We don't have what it takes to go to the cross for nobody. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The one that went to the cross for all of mankind was sinless so he could bear all the sins of the world into his body. But what God expects for you and I with this scripture is that when we have, uh, when God presents to us someone that has a need. He presents that to us. It comes in our pathway. You see that that person has a need. Guess what God expects from you and I? That we perform a selfless act by uh, stepping out of our selfish desires and perform as a selfless act on behalf of that person. So whatever it is that that person need at that particular time, God has, a, he already knows that you have the ability and the wherewithal to do it. And that should happen with every believer without saying, I'm going to tell you personally, when I come across of those that profess to be a believer in Christ, when the Bible says you shall know them by the fruit that they bear, that right there is, is going to be a telltale sign to Arthur, whether or not they're actually a believer in Christ. When they unselfishly, uh, a sacrifice on behalf of somebody else. Because do you not know that's what the Father did for us? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever would believe upon him would not perish but would have everlasting life. And you tell me you can't help somebody? Oh, my, we're in this together. Okay. When have you felt most alone? Might as well be honest with yourself. When have you felt most alone? I'm going to tell you. I'm just thinking about it. I never thought about it before, but the most I probably felt alone was when my mother died. And I came home and found her dead when I was 17 years old. And for about 42 years... 42 years, every year, never fail. March, her birth month. May, Mother's Mother's Day month. Uh, November, Thanksgiving month. December, C 
Christmas month, I went into a funk that I call, I, I didn't call myself uh, in the depression. That was too harsh. I said, I went into a malaise. That's a depression. And the last time I did this, it lasted for more than a year and a half. I'm telling you, I functioned through four for 42 years. People did not know what was going on internally with Arthur because they I, I didn't express that on the outward. And I certainly didn't tell, tell nobody. It's only by God's mercy, God's mercy, that I was able to come through this thing and not just totally lose my mind. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna share something which I have it in my book, so it's not a mystery. Uh, I didn't get here by myself. I'm Rebecca's son that I'm gonna revise and and, re, and republish. It's published now, but I'm gonna check, make some corrections on some uh, typo errors and also grammatical errors. Not completely. Some of the grammar in there is is relevant to the the voice of where I want it to come from, like from the South when they said certain things. I wanted to have that feeling, so I left the. I, I did that on purpose. But there's some things that I need to correct, and I'm going to do that and republish it again. Um, but my mother, when I came home at the age of 17, we were living in the Commodore Perry projects in Buffalo, New York, and in the bathroom we had plumbing fixtures that uh, went be went between from the toilet to the tub. And when I came home, I went was going to the bathroom. I opened up the bathroom door, and my mother was there hanging from those pipes, dead. Let me tell you, that was on November the 19th of 1969. It is August the 1st, the year 2022. From that day up until now, Nobody has ever had a conversation with Arthur about what I saw. And I'm here to tell you that besides that and the drugs and the alcohol and the way I drank alcohol back in the day, I used to drink from the age of 16, 17, 18, 19. Well, before I went into service, I used to drink four fifths of a pint of Bacardi rum, 151. And I used to drink the bottle like this. I would grab the bottle or pull off the top and drink like this. And by the time I put the bottle down, there was nothing in the bottle. When I went to college at the age of 18, there were kids, Caucasian kids, in the dormitory, because I lived on the dormitory. They were doing shots of 80 proof. Don't you know, some of these folks were dying from uh, alcohol, mm, alcohol intoxication. I drank four-fifths of a pint of 151 Bacardi rum. Not 80 proof, 151 proof. And I did, I did some drugs. The, there was THC. Uh, uh, we used to snort it like cocaine. I, 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 I OD'd on that one time. I've done, I OD'd on barbiturates and, and, and um, prescription Robitussin. I did a lot of cocaine. I didn't freebase. I didn't, I, I, I snorted uh, heroin. I didn't skin pop. I didn't use a needle to ingest drugs, but I blew up my nose. My nose, as you can see, is pretty big. <laughs> it's only by his mercy that I'm able to sit here and speak coherently have a cognitive, uh, cognitive understanding of things, be able to look at something, be able to understand things. Because I quite, you guys don't know, there were times in in my in my time in my life because I've spent most of my life by myself, a loner. I'm an introvert by nature. I've had times where I would even question whether I was understanding things, because I would be into that malaise of mine. And your mind start playing tricks on your homie, making you think that you don't, you're not where who you are, and you're not do, able to do what you're able to do. 
I tell people, don't let yourself get isolated. I don't care what you think you, what you believe about yourself in the Lord and how strong you are in the Lord and don't do it. You're not, you're, you're not strong enough to withstand the attack that comes on your mind by yourself. But when you realize that you're in this together, in this together with God himself, and he's got you, then you make every effort that you can to understand some things about yourself and do not let what you do not allow yourself to think like, oh, okay, I got this. It's okay. I got it. No, you don't. You need to find somebody that you can release this thing to. They ought to be like Jesus Christ did in Matthew, the 26th chapter, starting around that 36th verse, when he left the place of the last supper that he had with his disciples on the night that he was to be arrested and crucified. He had 11 disciples left because uh, Judas Iscariot had been dispatched by him to go and do what he was going to do. He had allowed the devil to enter into him and he was going to uh, sell out Jesus to the chief priests for 30 pieces of silver. He said, that what you do, you go do quickly. And Judas got up from the table and went and did what he had to do. So he, after he, he left with uh, the place with the leaven and he told them to sit here and wait while I go in yonder and pray. But then we find out in the 37th verse that he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and Zebedee, James and John with him and told and showed them his emotion. And then in verse 38, he says, I am grieved, I'm greatly, dis- I'm greatly grieved and distressed beyond, uh, beyond death. He spoke his emotions, told him to stay here, stay awake and watch while I go and pray. He went in the garden, prayed a prayer three times. Father, if it be any way that you could remove this cup from my hands. In other words, he knew he was about ready to die. He knew how he was going to die. He knew the process leading up to his death. He did not want to do it that way. He didn't mind completing the assignment because he knew what he came to do, but he wanted to be another way. That was his flesh. But because he released himself to three of his disciples, that was his inner circle, he gained strength. Because when you release something, especially when it's about your weakness, the Bible says in your weakness, He's made strong. How do you make God strong? You don't make God strong, but he becomes strong in you when you realize I can't do this and I need your help. So I'm here to tell you, this is how you get through going through what you're going through and realizing that you're in this together. And so how have you sensed God's presence during times of separation from loved ones? Once I got saved, I understood that if the Lord had not been with Arthur and he had to be with me from afar off, you know why? Because I had not known him. I had not known him when I was unsaved, but he knew me. He knew me. Um, You check out my message that I did for Kingdom Purpose Television that's going to air on Wednesday at 9 a.m., I talked about about knowing uh, God, knowing who we are. Amen. All right, there's a prayer here. Thank you, dear Father, for the gift of your spirit's comfort and for the community of believers you brought into my life. Now, I'm going to say something behind that prayer. I, I, I told you that it's sad that you don't have family members operating in the way that they should. But because we have a loving father, when he says he never leave us nor forsake us, he even says this, when your father and your mother forsake you, I will take you up as my own. Well, let me tell you, it just ain't the father and the mother when you have brothers and sisters, cousins and aunts and uncle nims, when they forsake you, you know what God will do? He will send somebody to represent what these folks should be representing. They will be family. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, listen to me. I have got people in my life today that are not my DNA blood family, but they are more family to me than my blood people are. Why? Because they've been there with me through times and things of nature when I needed somebody to lift me up. When I needed somebody to say, we want you to be a part of our family and they show forth family love to this very day. 
it wasn't just a one shot deal. I've got folk that I really actually call family because that's what they represent to Arthur. I don't discount my family. I don't discredit my family. I don't disown my natural blood family, but I'm here to tell you, don't be surprised when your blood family ain't going to come through for you. Let me help you real good here. Don't you know, first off, Jesus Christ says he came unto his own. The Bible says Jesus Christ came unto his own and they received him not. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's go to Mark third chapter and i'm gonna be in the 20th verse and i'm really gonna be done we're in this together oh my i didn't know i didn't read i didn't know i didn't read the devotion until now that's why it's, it's, it's catching me mark 3 20 says then he came to a house in capernaum that's jesus christ uh and a crowd formed again so many people that jesus and his disciples could not even eat a meal together watch verse 21 when his own family heard this, they went to take custody of him, for they were saying he is out of his mind. Now, mind you, let me help you. Jesus is out ministering, doing outreach ministry, because that's what he did. His family, nowhere near him. Supporting him? Nope. With him in the ministry? Nope. But when they heard that what was going on, that these crowds are following him, he went into this house. People followed him into the house. They decided from wherever they was that they was going to come. And I'm going to tell you what they, this represents to me. This is a first century because this was during the first century. You do realize the first century. We're in the 21st century. This is the first century intervention. They thought he was out of his mind. Now, I got a problem with that. I got a real problem with this. At this time, we're talking his, his mother and his brothers. Now, let me help you about 33 and a half years prior the angel gabriel came from the throne of god directly from the throne of god and came down and spoke to mary a teenage bride to be betrothed espoused to a man by the name of joseph of the tribe of benjamin in the lineage of king david and told her that she was she was blessed by God and highly favored among men. God himself had chose her to do something extraordinary, supernatural. It ain't never been done before. It ain't going to never be done again. You shall conceive a child and his name shall be called Jesus. He's going to save me, the savior of the world, save the world from its sin. Now, Mary, very young, teenage, teenager. She's a, a female. She doesn't have the ability to go to school like the boys do because the culture didn't let them do that. Women, no. Men, boys, yeah. Sound familiar? Um, and then she ain't never heard nobody talk to her or any other woman the way that this angel spoke to him. So obviously he couldn't have been a, a part of them. And she recognized that he had to come from God. And so she, she acknowledged him. But then she says, sir, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm going to isogeet this text, if you will, and go according to where the spirit is leading me. She like, well, you know, sir, I appreciate you telling me what you said, because I'm honored that you did that, because nobody's ever done anything like that for me before. And I've never heard any other woman spoken in the, in the manner that you're speaking about me. I appreciate that. But, I, I, I you know, I'm a little thrown back. Um, first off, um, I, I'm a young child, a teenager, and I don't have the education that the boys have. Um, but, um, and, but I do understand a few things, sir. I, I'm respectfully, I, I, I want you to hear what I'm saying. I, 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 I understand natural birth about a man and a woman. I, I, I understand that, but I'm a virgin. I'm still a virgin. I've been a virgin from birth. Nothing has changed. So I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out in my mind with what I have the ability to do to figure this out, but I, I can't see how I, being a virgin, can conceive a child without a man. I don't see how that can happen. And then the angel said, "Well, fear not, Mary. Um, I understand your concern, and they're valid. God understands. He anticipated you might, you would come that way." 
and you, you have valid concerns, but let me tell you something. You know more than what you think you know, child. Uh, you, you, you understand a lot more than what your, what your age may belie that you should understand. But let me tell you, what's going to happen with you is going to be very similar if you've heard any parts of what the Torah, uh, the Bible, you know, the, the, the scriptures say about uh, creation. Well, the Bible tells us in the, I'm not, well, the Torah, I'm not the Bible. The Torah tells us that, uh, tells you that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was a vast wasteland without form. It was devoid of form. And, and there was, uh, the, the, the spirit was hovering over the prime evil deep of the waters, expanse of the waters. And God said, let there be light and light came forth and then God separated the light. light in one he made day and the other he made night. Let me tell you, child, it's very similar. While I'm speaking to you right now, the Holy Spirit is hovering above you. And I'm telling you that you're going to be pregnant. Matter of fact, you're pregnant now. Now, let me help you understand something. You got a cousin named Elizabeth. She and her husband, Zacharias, he's that priest that's in the Holy of Holies right now for the atonement of the sins. Uh, you call this the day of what, Yom Kippur? Well, he's in there. And 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 and, and I've, I've already spoken to him, had to deal with him because, well, this is different. But uh, yeah, but but she, your cousin, she's six months pregnant already. She ain't been, she's been barren ever since they've been married. They've been married about 40 some odd years. She's beyond the, the age of, 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 of conception. She is six months pregnant right now. And then the angel left her. Well, no, the angel stopped talking. And Mary said, well, be it as you say. I'm the handmaiden of the Lord. In other words, uh, you know what? I got you. I understand now it's clear. Because you gave me the clarification that I need. Mary, that was 33 years and a half in the, in, in the past. Now, fast forward to where we are right now. What happened to your understanding? You see, there's a song that says, Mary, did you know? You know, did you know that your son would be crucified? Did you know that your son would die? That's a good sounding song. But let me ask, I, I got another song. Mary, what happened with what you knew? Because now you think your son is crazy, out of his mind. Something's wrong with that picture. Let's drop down to verse number 31. I'm telling you. Then his mother and his brothers arrived. And standing outside, they sent word to him and called for him. Remember, they, they think he's crazy. 32, a crowd was sitting around him. And they said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Now, let me help you understand this. And I'm, I'm going to help you real good. They sent a messenger inside to tell Jesus to come outside his family, his mama and the brothers. The people recognizing that's his natural blood family, said, you know, Jesus, you're sure. Your, your peeps are out there, outside. Why don't you go outside? It's, it's a lot of, it ain't no room in here for nobody. Uh, but they could come in, but they have to squeeze their way in here, you know. It, they'd have to really press their way in. But they, but they can come in because there's always room for more. Oh, uh, yeah, unlike at the end. Yeah, oh, my, yeah. Mm -hmm. They can get in here, but but it would be hard for them. So why don't you go outside to them? We ain't going nowhere. And if it seemed like you ain't coming back, we're coming out. Because wherever you go, we go. Watch what he said in verse 33. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? What? Jesus, where that come from? They outside. 34. Looking at those who were sitting in a circle around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. What was he saying? If you really are related to me, connected to me, you would seek after me with your whole heart. You wouldn't let something like a crowd keep you away from me. The woman with the issue of blood for 12 years Weak, y'all. Issue of blood means that she was anemic. She might have been uh, uh, at least anemic at best, but she didn't have the necessary strength that you would need to have because her blood wasn't where it needed to be. She had spent all of her resources trying to get doctors to, to take care of her. They took her for her money, but they didn't do nothing to help her. 
So then she said, one day, I believe that if I can get close to Jesus, where all I need to do is just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made whole. She, the Bible says she pressed her way and touched his garment and was immediately healed. And Jesus said, who touched me? The disciples, his, his peeps around him, his secular fan, no, second, his second, no, his, not secular, his uh, spiritual family said, what are you talking about, Jesus? You sure? Everybody's touching you. We're all on top of one another. He said, no, you understand. Somebody touched me with other than their hand and their finger. They touched me with their faith. And because they touched me with their faith, power left me. Anytime you touch God with faith, power leaves him to come to you to do what needs to be done for you. That woman got healed because she pressed her way and touched him. He was saying, look, uh, 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 who are my mother and my brothers? Looking at those, here are my mother and my brothers. You came to see with me. You came to be with me. They on the outside. Watch what he says in verse 35. For whoever does the will of God by believing in me and following me, he is my brother and sister and mother. And let me tell you, following me is not following him from a distance, from the peripheral. He rewards those who diligently seek after him. Why? We're in this together. And, and did I read this? Yeah, let me do the prayer. Thank you, dear Father, for the gift of the, your spirit's comfort and for the community of believers you brought into my life. Oh, yeah, this came from the prayer community of believers you brought into my life. I thank God for those that he brought into my life that have been become my family in more ways than one. And we're in this together. Whoa, that was something, guys. I don't know if you felt what I felt, but um, I'm sure you did because you know why? Isaiah 55, 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It will prosper in the very thing I intended to do. It will not come back to me void uses without having what Arthur achieved the desired intent or effect. Why am I saying that? Because the God that I serve is a God of purpose. He doesn't say anything, doesn't do anything unless there's a purpose behind it. And the purpose is for you to believe. And somebody out there that's non-believing, uh, the, the time is now for you to believe in the one that tells you that we're in this together. When I say in this together, don't you know that your salvation is not going to be left up to you? In my closing benediction, you'll hear me say something like this. is now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless, watch this, before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. It's to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. We're in this together. God says, listen, you're unsaved. Now's the time. I, I, I made the gift more than 2,000 years ago. It's available to you right now. All you need to do is come forth with selfless humility, being willing and able to admit that you're a sinner right now. Because I need that honesty. Because when you worship me, it must be in spirit and in truth. So I already know. I just need you to be honest with me and yourself, because why? Uh, I'm, I'm going to make you a new creation. Uh, you're not going to be the same. Well, you're not going to be a sinner. You're going to become a saint. So what do you need to do? Confess with your mouth. Jesus Christ is Lord. Believe in your heart. God the Father raised him from the dead. The Bible says you will be saved. That's Romans 10th chapter, the ninth verse. You just got reconciled, redeemed adopted into the family of God, made a joint heir with Christ or the Messiah to uh, the kingdom of heaven and heaven belongs to you. But before you go get, and get real happy, happy, um, you need to find yourself into a Bible believing teaching church because you need to get to that past and let them know that you're saved, but you need to be baptized, baptized by water, uh, repent for your sins. And, and also, oh my, yeah, baptized in the Holy Spirit so that you can receive the gift of the Spirit and allow him to seal you until the day of redemption so that you can hear now unto him. Now, for those of you that are in a backslidden state, you did like the prodigal son. You know the word. Yeah, you did it. You, you, you went back in the time and slipped back in the darkness, brought out of darkness 
into the marvelous light, told to walk in the light, but you went backwards instead of going forward and upward. That's all right. <laughs> His mercy is everlasting, but don't 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 get it don't get it twisted. Shall you continue in sin in order that God's grace may overflow and and, and overbound? Certainly not. How can we, the very ones who died to sin, continue to live in it any longer? Check out Romans of 6, chapter, the first through the second verse. Matter of fact, read the whole chapter. It deals with sanctification. Yeah. Um, so you're going to come forth with godly sorrow and that repent of heart, meaning that you know that you erred, but you know that you cannot do this again because this is your loving father and you do not want to displease him. So you don't want to do this thing again. You might do some other stuff, but not this. You got delivered from this. And besides, here's word for you. Just in case you didn't know, you ain't going to have no way of escape. You ain't going to have no excuse. When you know what is the right thing to do and you fail to do it to you, it is sin. James, the fourth chapter, the 17th verse, 17th verse. Now, what you got to do is, well, if you confess all your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sins, and he will continue to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. That's First John, the first chapter, the ninth verse, you just got restored. Now, for those of you that are in a backslidden, no, not a backslidden state, help me, Ruach HaKadosh. You're just tired. You're weary. You're worn out. You didn't know that you would have to go through all that you had to go through on this salvation walk. You should have known. But you didn't for whatever reason. You might have thought you were just going life was going to be easy peasy. No, nah, child, it ain't easy peasy. It's a rough life. It's a hard knock life. But it gets smoother if you follow the leading of the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm telling you. Yes, it will. But you got tired. You stopped. You need to get your strength renewed. You got to get re-energized because why? There's work to do. <laughs> so what do you need to do? Look to the hills. Where, where shall my help come? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. All your help come from the Lord God that made heaven and earth. That's Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. And it's actually a question. Psalm 1, the verse 1 is actually a question. Look to the hills and then where shall my help come? That's a question. Check the word. Check the book. Now, your strength has got renewed. So you're back in the race. You're running your race because you can't run somebody else's. But how are you doing it? Well, know this. The race ain't given to the swift. But to them that endure, endure to the end with patient endurance. What are you saying, Bishop? Like if it ain't about physical stamina and about having strength. No, it's about being able to put up with the stuff that you're going to encounter along the way. Strife, misery, pain, persecution, depression, oppression. Oh, family and church folk. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Now, when you find yourself a little wearied and worn and fainting, like you can't just go on, then guess what? Remind yourself, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Philippians 4.13, it works for Arthur. Now, every single one of you, get yourself into a Bible, believe, and teach in church. I'm telling you, you need to have the fundamental instruction of God's word uh, um, imparted into you, taught to you, uh, building you up, uh, establishing a foundation up under you that cannot be moved. And um, God expects you to grow and become mature in your understanding because uh, he has a work assignment for you called the Great Commission found in Matthew, the 28th chapter, the 19th and the 20th verse. Now, stay hungry and thirsty for the word of God and foremost God himself. You see God's word is a lamp unto our feet. It is a light unto our path. Study to show yourselves approved unto God. A workman needing not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God loves you, and so do I. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen, amen, amen. You're living your best life when you're living your life 
in Yeshua, Messiah, or Jesus Christ. Now, Mr. Black, Arthur L. Weathersby, um, the next devotional reading I'm going to do later on today, Lord's willing, will come from God's purpose for your life. Uh, 365 Devotions, Dr. Charles F. Stanley, the senior pastor of the First Baptist Church of Atlanta. And we're going to be in Galatians, the fifth chapter, the 17th verse. And it says, choose his spirit. And uh, the next thing that I'll be doing will be live on the radio with Kingdom Purpose Radio present my third week of music and talk with Bishop elect Arthur L. Weathersby at www.kingdompurposeradio.com. Or why don't you just download the free app? on Google Play Store at Kingdom Purpose Radio. And also get Kingdom Purpose TV because I'm on there on Wednesday too. Amen. I'm on Friday as well <laughs> at 11 a.m. <laughs> on radio. So come with me and listen to the best in gospel music by artists you know and some you don't know. You likely may not know some of these artists because I'm, I'm playing folks that I'm trying to uh, support, that I'm trying to encourage and I'm trying to get you to support them by purchasing their music. These are great gospel artists that you don't know because they don't have the hoopla and all that other stuff. They don't have record labels that are uh, spending money to, to get them promoted. And this, that, and the other God has given me a platform uh, to be able to do that. I was doing it on my Facebook page anyhow. <laughs> Amen. Now I, I got this vehicle, so I'm doing it there too. I'm, I'm gonna keep doing it. So why don't you come join me at three o'clock? That's about an hour. That's about two hours and fifteen minutes. Amen. Amen. So I'm grateful to God for everything. I thank God for these devotional teachings. I was telling my apostle this morning on uh, Dr. Me and our Quentin Sampson that this has been a great benefit for me and my understanding and being understanding God's word and being able to present it. It's been greater because of what God has uh, allowed me to do because I was obedient to the spirit because that's what he told me to do, told me to teach these devotionals. And that's what I'm doing. So to God be the glory until I come back at you. You have to understand something when we're in this together. And yes, we are. And, and, and you know, I'm going to I'm going to go back to the original way I had it done before. It all depends on how how things are flowing. But. And this is one thing that you have to understand. We are in this together because we are, guess what? We do the thing. And the Lord, God bless you. I say he crazy. He's straight up crazy. No, I'm not. Well, hey, 